Okay, very good morning. It is Monday the 4th of March. Hope you had a good weekend. Um, going to do our usual kind of Monday look ahead, uh, looking at the entirety of the week. And then I'll hand you over to, to Sam and he can look over the charts from a, a slightly bigger top level uh, kind of oversight of some key levels maybe to look at um, over the coming trading sessions. Um, for any of those who did or didn't, um, we do, myself now, do a, a session on a Sunday more often or not. Um, so if you wanted to utilize some time or maybe on a Sunday afternoon, if you have some downtime, um, then what I did yesterday is I recorded a live session uh, that I did and that will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search for Amplifier Trading. Um, all you need to do is subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell and regardless of whether you see that broadcast live or not, um, you will get basically the ability to be able to watch the recording anyway. So yeah, we're going to be doing that from, from going forward. Uh, I know a couple of you did join us, so thanks for, for taking part in the session, but just for those who didn't, going forward. All right, let's get down into what is going on at the moment. Um, so a couple of things are moving right now as I'm speaking. So I know a few of you might be in trades already. So Euro dollar, um, just under a little bit of pressure here, top left corner, uh, just breaking through some of the recent range that we've had. Uh, what would have been the back end of, guess, of last week. So a little bit of downside coming through and looks to be, um, well, the dollar index is now trading up through uh, what looked like highs that were seen uh, very early on, or I could say during the Asia Pacific session. So we're up about one tenth now in the Dixie. Uh, cable pretty static though. Uh, so possibly maybe a little bit of Euro technical breach uh, we'll get into some of the headlines because we've got the ECB, of course, coming out later this week and we can discuss that as well. Otherwise, you can see uh, in the centre charts, you've got the DAX, Future, uh, NASDAQ and the S&P. And you can see in the US indices, Europe the same, uh, a gap up in the reopening of electronic trade overnight. Um, again, I'm not going to dwell on the charts from a technical perspective because I'll leave that for, for Sam to do. But the longer term, obviously, S&P picture here of course being that key level that we are watching on the retest on that trend line uh, from the end of last year and obviously we gapped up again having closed above that level on Friday and so challenging up at around levels from that 3rd of December high so um, we'll look at that trade war headline that came very late yesterday uh, late afternoon early evening helping lift some of that sentiment overnight and consequently China did trade a positive performance in the Asia Pacific session. Interestingly though from a DAX perspective any relief on progress on that side has been decidedly short-lived and we've already closed the gap and in fact just moved back down to find some support or pivot uh, at this present point in time. Um, so let's let's get into some of the news then and have a look at what's on the agenda for the week and well I won't go through this line by line completely. I'm just going to pick out some singular events that I think you guys should be aware of. Um, and then we can talk about some individual related stories as well that go along this. Things like Brexit, of course, uh, and also the trade war update. So in terms of today's session, it very is, or very much is a digestion of that report which did come out overnight. So let's jump immediately to that. Uh, and this was in the Wall Street Journal where US and China are close to a trade deal that may end American tariffs. So it's quite interesting actually. Um, if you remember, the last uh, article that came out when Trump tweeted was one hour before Globex electronic trade reopened on a Sunday, and that was when he said that talks are broken down. Now it came a few hours before, and it's the opposite. Now talks are going positive, and this is kind of the next evolution of kind of progress, if you like, on this situation. So we've had a meaningful, positive response in, in markets. I would say, and um, Sam might have to toss me the Trump hat, because again, I think this is absolutely textbook timing, because there's something happening in China this week. Um, and that is their National Party Congress. This is a meeting that they have to kind of discuss and set high-level policy in China. Uh, and guess what? That starts today. And it lasts all week. 
and lasts around 10 days in total. But this is the most important parliamentary gathering that you see in China on a yearly basis. And Trump tweets just the day before that that gets underway about how you know, they're making um, some concessions. They want to get to a point where they can sort of sign a deal off. So again, like, as much as you think that this is quite erratic the way this has gone, I do think that there is some... Uh, intention timing wise to do this at the right time for those who are, are not familiar I know this infographic is particularly small but I'll share the link afterwards for anyone who's interested I often get a lot of questions about the Chinese kind of power structure if you like because it is quite quite different from what we're used to in the in a Western kind of democracy and here you've got the, the kind of general secretary and the all main consuming power which is right at the top in the hands of Xi Jinping. Uh, you then have the senior of what's called the Politburo Standing Committee. This is something like with the uh, Bank of England with the MPC for example or the FOMC in the US. For the Chinese government you have what's called the PSC, the Politburo Standing Committee. Now these guys really like when it comes to China and what China is doing uh, economically, foreign affairs and, and everything in between it's really concentrated within this small cluster of people uh, and obviously feeding into to Xi uh, where the balance of power lies so I won't go into this in too much detail about the subsectioning and who's in charge of what but if you ever did want a crib sheet of all the relevant names for, for what uh, given how important the trade war is for global markets it's not a bad thing to just have a glance at and get familiar with a couple of the names so you can be if the the situation ever arose a bit more responsive to interpretation of news if it's one of these other Politburo members outside of the more familiar ones that make a comment so yeah that's probably the the big story for Monday because from an economic calendar point of view it is pretty quiet there's not a great deal going on um, UK construction PMI, I mean, that's a bit of a moot point. The other thing we're looking at from the UK economic data calendar, really, from this week is the service PMI. Um, that's going to come tomorrow on Tuesday. Uh, on that point, looking at Tuesday, uh, that kicks off and commences what is a central bank decision week. You've got the RBA, which will be coming tonight. You've then got the BOC on Wednesday, and you've got the ECB uh, on Thursday, which is going to be the one that we're going to be focusing on the, mo the most. On that note, let's have a look at what to expect from the ECB. Um, and this was just a graphic that I pulled out from a, a Bloomberg Economist survey from the weekend. Well, it was compiled the prior week, uh, but released at the weekend. And what we're looking at here is that this, if you're, if you're breaking it down into its parts, obviously it's a two-part event. You have the uh, initial interest rate decision and the, and the statement that accompanies that at 12.45, then you have the press, press conference at uh, 1.30. Now, the additional factor that you get in this week's ECB meeting is that much like the Fed on those quarterly ones or the quarterly inflation report from the Bank of England, the ECB are releasing their uh, staff projections. Now, what this means is they give you information about their um, kind of medium-term horizon view for growth and inflation, which is obviously very important to see what their uh, consequent monetary policy could be going forward. Now, the interest rate statement as it exists at the moment is that they're going to keep rates on hold at least through the summer or as long as needed. Um, but one-third of those surveyed by Bloomberg, these are bank economists, predict it will alter its guidance to signal a later lift-off um, we're not expecting that to happen as soon as this meeting, but ultimately, just given the economic situation, political stresses in the individual countries within Europe, you know, it's looking very unlikely that the ECB is going to be able to execute a rate hike. Also layering in the fact that Draghi's term comes to an end, so you're going to have a transition in the president role, and the markets are priced well into 2020 for the next rate hike. So what is it that we are looking at? Well, from a European perspective, it's going to be these projections and how downbeat have um, they become? Because the last time that we had these projections was in December. That's the purple bar that you can see. And you can see the Economist survey and the Bloomberg economics uh, expectation then of what they're looking for is quite significant downgrades. So how the currency might react definitely is going to be a reaction effect of the pessimism or not that we see 
uh, on the growth and inflation front. Uh, and on that note, the, the euro is seeing a bit of uh, weakness at the moment. And as that looks like it's just giving the dollar a little bit of a lift, keep an eye on gold. That's also session lows now. Uh, let me just bring the charts back over. Gold just breaching uh, the low point that was seen would have been the back end of last week. Uh, down about 10 bucks already this morning. And obviously gold, maybe a little bit of an unwind of some of that um, that flight to quality bid. And then we had the trend line break, of course, you remember from last week. And so technically, obviously now we, we've gone through some significant downside support levels. Uh, the trend line to 1300, that all went in very quick fashion uh, on Friday. And so now it does open up the prospects of potentially some further um, downside in the near term. Again, I'll let Sam go over that and his thoughts on uh, targets potentially. Outside the ECB, back to the, the calendar for a second. Um, Wednesday, you start to get a um, bit of a build up then for the non farm payroll release on Friday. Now, you'll notice that with non-farm payrolls if you if you listen to the briefing on Sunday or if you're, you're listening now I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about non-farm payrolls because uh, I don't really think it's that warranted to be quite frank I think if you have a job number in line with expectations around 180 unemployment at 3.9 uh, the wage data I think largely is n the whole report in itself is not going to be particularly influential to really shift the needle from where we are and how the markets are priced in terms of federal reserve policy at this point so of course the employment data does create short-term intraday volatility what i'm saying is from a stepping out of that environment and looking at the broader picture i don't think it's going to be particularly too much of a game changer um, payrolls of course being on the eighth so the one exception then as we discussed being delayed uh, given the, the the first of the month was a friday in that respect so time to gather the data and so on uh, ADP then that means you're going to get on Wednesday um, and you get the various ISM indicators as well so maybe an eye on the job constituents of those major reports to give you a bit of a better insight as to how the, the BLS report will come out from the government on Friday. Uh, from a US data point of view the ISM non-manufacturing PMI I think is potentially quite interesting. Um, the reason for that is because of the recent deterioration that we've had uh, within US economic data particularly that really quite catastrophically bad retail sales number we printed uh, what two weeks ago now so it'd be interesting to see how the non-manufacturing PMI numbers are holding up uh, and that will be on Tuesday um, otherwise going through the rest of the week let's just run through the stories because as I said there's not a lot of UK economic data coming out but there is quite a lot of Brexit related updates to make you aware of one thing to be clear here, there's political updates, but there is zero movement in the pound this morning. So just to make that upfront statement, there's a big difference here between, I think, what the markets have kind of bedded in to what could then create a market move. And I think a lot of the news is more updates than it is anything really groundbreaking kind of development. So let me give you a quick summary of what's happened over the weekend. So um, the pro-Brexit hardliners of the Conservative Party in the Sunday Times at the weekend have basically thrown their support behind Theresa May now. This isn't really new. This was something that we had last week, but it's been re-emphasised in press. This being the fact that the Brexiteers, i.e. the ERG members, Jacob Rees-Mogg and co, are, would rather accept May's deal with some slight tweaks on the backstop issue than have the or run the gauntlet and the risk then that we go down the route of no Brexit at all. Better to have something watered down than just no Brexit. So that's kind of a repetition, if you like, hence the reason why the market's not really moving. There's nothing too new there. The other thing was in the mail, the mail on Sunday. Um, Brady said the country is um, basically tired of vacillation and delay. To be honest, you know, this is... Uh, I know I shouldn't bring my own personal view into this, but I really hate it when politicians use words like that. I mean, that, that just goes to show how out of touch they are. I'm sorry, but I mean, or is it just me? Is my vocabulary just particularly bad? But uh, there you go. But 
Brady said that basically the country's getting tired of this 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 kind of circus that's Brexit, the lack of progression, uh, and urges colleagues to pull behind the Prime Minister and help her to deliver our exit from the European Union. So again, someone of significance throwing their weight in a similar fashion to behind the ERG. This is all very positive for the prospects of an orderly Brexit. And actually, if um, Stephen Barclay, the Brexit secretary, and the Attorney General Geoffrey Cox can deliver on the technicality side, the legal binding nature of the backstop, well, guess what? You've got yourself a May deal on the cards. Uh, and then that gets forwarded through. Sign-off then comes for potentially the kind of regulatory delay in order for it to get all parliamentary approvals and then we move into transition. So it could be quite positive that way. The other side of this is, well, if we eradicate the no deal, that also could be quite positive. So a couple of different things going on here. Uh, the other thing and the final thing from the weekend is Labour opposition have shifted position now in support of SECA referendum. But if you read the weekend's press, there's there's a large number of Labour politicians who are incredibly unhappy. Don't forget, Labour in itself is quite split. Split enough, in fact, that it's splintered into partly an independent centrist group under now Chukar Amuna, to all the way on the other side, there are Labour members who think absolutely we should deliver Brexit, and even Brexit at the, at the expense of the economy with a no deal. So there's definitely just, it's not a Conservative split, there's also Labour split. And what's happened here is dozens of Labour lawmakers representing Brexit, Brexit supporting constituencies uh, are now kind of also saying that, look, Corbyn, we don't want a second referendum, we want a Brexit. And so therefore, if you start putting all of these together, you know, is, is Theresa going to pull it off uh, in the end? The sweetener from Theresa here, I don't know if you read this this morning, this is of course... Um, Philip Hammond and the Chancellor and the Chancellor is set to receive a multi-billion pound windfall for public finances when he presents his spring statement don't forget that's coming in what a week or so's time March 13th now the press have absolutely jumped onto this I think Sky News's headline is that Theresa May is basically paying off people of Britain to support her deal by throwing I think it's an extra couple of billion up to the northeastern side of England, which obviously is a much more uh, pro-leave area in order to you know, get some popular backing for her deal. So there's a lot of things going on here that are kind of tipping the balance potentially in the government's favour uh, for, for the Brexit situation. So with that being said, cable unmoved. I don't think, I think a lot of, don't forget cable has albeit pulled back a little bit at the end of last week. We've had a phenomenal rise over the course of just a couple of weeks. And really, this is the pricing in of all of the things that I've just mentioned coming to fruition. Now, just wanted to add in, and let me put a rectangle here. We just had um, Morgan Stanley come out. Now, Morgan Stanley, a fairly sizable US bank, and they've come out and they've recommended going long cable at market in the spot market at 132.40 so pretty much bang on where we're trading and they're saying they're targeting 140 with a stop at 131 so MS have come out and they're pumping it with their clients they're literally hitting market looking to go long with a stop down at 131 which is going to be well, if I just mark it up about here, just a touch higher, up and looking for a trade return at 140. That's uh, pretty bold. I can see what they're saying. You've got about, what, one and a half points of protection downside for a little bit of volatility. But the way the news and this situation is developing is upside relief now because the probability of a no deal is in, in, increasingly diminishing to a point of non-existent and so therefore downside risks are very small and so we've we breached that September high that came in here which was the previous week high certainly that opens up a quick one to 135 and that will probably act as a decent support point for a continuation of a push higher so obviously you're talking a lot more of a medium time frame here than anything intraday 
but you know, quite interesting US bank being pretty aggressive on that call this morning. I'll leave you to decide whether or not you agree with them. Okay, a few final things then uh, for me to mention. And that is, uh, I did check the weather forecast this morning in New York. Um, I think they did have a bit of snowfall, but nothing towards what potentially could have been very dramatic for them, uh, given what the weekend forecasts were predicting. Um, this is what I was looking at on Sunday, which was the kind of projections of the weather patterns. You can see that was anticipated potentially a foot of snow in New York City. I don't think that has materialized, so not expecting there to be any impact really for traders' ability to be able to get to work stateside in the, on the northeast coast today. Uh, power grid prices uh, have shot higher at the end of last week because of this unexpected cold snap, but if it hasn't really delivered in terms of this morning, then maybe you get a bit of a pullback in those prices that uh, were elevated on Friday. Um, so that is pretty much it from me. So for the week as a whole, I would say Brexit is relatively... Um, you know, all the updates aside, hasn't been much response in the pound because everything is kind of going as is expected or planned. Uh, UK economic data is relatively few and far between. You've got the service PMI is probably to stand out on Tuesday. I would say any Brexit rumours about deal, no deal will come towards the end of the week. ECB on Thursday, non-farms on Friday, the Chinese Politburo kind of National Party Congress meeting all week. So look out for their growth targets, any response that they make to the trade developments. One thing I would say here is that the market has had, in terms of um, response to the developments on this Bloomberg article about potential breakthrough. Remember, this is not official line. These are people unidentified, familiar with the talks. With that, how many times have we seen this where it looks like the trade talks are progressing, the market overextends, overinterprets, moves in a positive fashion, and then it breaks down again, and then it goes up, it breaks down again. So is this any different this time round yet to be seen? Okay, I'll hand you over to Sam. Have a good day. Weekly strategy report will issue uh, both of us later on this morning. Have a good week. Hi guys and uh, good morning. Hope you all had a uh, a good weekend. And having a quick look over uh, at gold now, which is just sort of extending through that that low of last week that Anthony mentioned. So definitely one to to keep an eye on. Obviously, with the the gap higher we we saw in in U.S. equities, uh, be worth keeping an eye. Should we push a bit lower on that uh, idea of the the gap fill, and you know just having a look at the S and P before we go longer term on it might be worth having uh, just uh, an idea of a potential long from there. Good uh, resistance that we saw on Friday. You know, if we can break that low of the day, which we've tested twice already, uh, either the short down to here to go long or, or vice versa, is, uh, is not a bad one to look at. Both the same in the Dow and uh, the NASDAQ as well. S&P on that longer term, you can see here, this is just from, you know, the levels drawn up from, from last week or, or previously. And we're, we're now sort of getting above that resistance line and, and testing 28. 15, which was the high back on the 3rd of December or around that area. I think, you know, got to favour the, the, the upside still for, for this market um, in general. Um, and those previous highs, obviously the next sort of target in mind, uh, really going back to October. And we get through that uh, and the lows that we broke down October the 10th will be sort of the, the targets all round. And having a look at the NASDAQ for similar sort of uh, chart time period the the 200 day moving average potentially one to to keep an eye on we found good support obviously this time last year then got choppy as it did across all markets on the on the breakdown to the back end of 2018 but we're above it albeit slowing down a bit but we have had 11 up weeks in a row now um, potential points for resistance to, to be aware of obviously going back to similar sort of time in in uh, november as the s p had levels there worth keeping an eye on but unless we really have some some negative news or any of these trend lines uh, break which have held so well then really I think favoring the the upside is is the way to go let me see if I can get one of those on yeah, it's a bit choppy but yeah next sort of key target area 8th of November high on the on the futures uh, and as long as we keep pushing 
to those points. I don't see any reason why to, to favour the downside as of yet. Dow Jones uh, did have a down week last week, albeit very tiny, uh, but obviously not far away at all from its, its high, all-time high. And, and what a key level it was uh, last week's high. You can see the 8th of October low before that big 10th of October breakdown, which we saw the retest back on November held really well. That 8th of November level, the same as the Nasdaq one we just talked about. And then last week's high. Uh, as well uh, being tested there so keep an eye on that I think the sentiment will go if we can get a confirmed break above then really it should be just a matter of time before we get the all-time high in the Dow Jones we know who's going to be very happy about that 2.8 percent away uh, to the downside as long as we can perhaps stay above just uh, this you know trend that we've had a couple of tests on Price marks might start getting to squeezed in before we really get a, a push elsewhere. But equities, um, you know, pushing higher, pushing higher. Uh, a couple of markets as well to, to be aware of where we closed last week. The euro pound, I know quite a few people were, were looking at this and we got the retest uh, of that multi-year uh, low level that broke through. You know, not exactly to the tick, but, you know, it's pretty good, isn't it? You can see the breakdown that we had retest and you know I think we can start to see a bit more downside to this market now having closed the week below uh, which you know albeit was in a bit of danger Friday night as we were going higher but uh, you know, the, the bears did take over again of course headlines can change all of that but I think while we are below that level uh, the downside should be the one favoured and perhaps looking more intraday I know the liquidity in the future sort of thins out a bit more intraday but you can see perhaps looking at the pivot today if we were to get you know a bit of a, a rally uh, into the afternoon break of that trend that we saw this morning retest of the pivot not a bad place to potentially look to to go short on that other markets on the longer time frame Aussie dollar we, we talked about at the back end of last week how it was under pressure and, and that is continuing so having a look here on the daily chart coming to some really key levels that low that we had back in the sort of middle early middle of of, uh, of Feb if that goes then you know really the market could be sort of eyeing up a, a decent push down to the low of the year and the Kiwi just lagging behind a touch and it, it doesn't seem all too far away perhaps from getting a, a test of this trend line I know from a shorter term perspective it would be worth keeping an eye on on here as we tested that low uh, sort of point from the 20th of Feb but keep an eye on that I think if the Aussie continues to go then uh, the, the Kiwi will uh, uh, will follow suit if you like gold as Ant mentioned we, we did break that trend line uh, last uh, on well on Friday I should say or Thursday night and the way gold has moved off of previous trend line breaks going back to June last year uh, you can really get a, a follow through from that and you know definitely one to to be careful about when you're looking to potentially go long key area in this market to the downside which uh, might be attracted to, uh, for a couple of uh, potential people to get long or take profit you can see all these lows the back end of last year and then to the sort of end of January around that area looking 1273 up to 1280 is obviously quite a key uh, point where perhaps potentially you have quite a lot of stops where people have you know gone long and placed those below so the way gold moves it wouldn't be too surprising to get that anytime soon 1300 was you know potentially a point where people might have looked to go long but that trend line break and the speed that it came down it just wasn't uh, interested in in holding up there at all from an intraday perspective worth keeping an eye what happens with this trend line here you can see going back from the 11th of April to the, the previous high that we had on 4th of Jan we're testing that just now and the reaction that we're getting not too far away so worth having that trend line on just to see how we uh, we get in so if you were looking to get short at the moment without a pullback you know you you would want this level to go and you can see even then you've got a previous high of the 23rd of Jan so quite a key area for gold today to, to keep an eye on on your daily charts as well for anyone that, that trades uh, T notes obviously we had this pattern drawn up last week and uh, we, we attempted twice at breaking out to the upside and quite a clear rejection closing below those levels and it wasn't really until uh, the 28th last day of Feb that we uh, continued that push down uh, to, to the downside and break of that pattern. Other key areas to the downside obviously around the, the handle 121 
uh, but also it would be quite interesting to see if we can get a retest of any of these levels, uh, previous lows as well, to potentially uh, get short. Obviously, with the, the data calendar for the for the week ahead and, and non-farm payrolls Friday, you know the the dollar market's going to obviously move a, a fair bit. So it would be preferring to to get uh, you know, a better better entry to get short than, than say now on the idea that the dollar might continue to strengthen and, and potentially on the index itself get uh, back towards sort of 97 uh, obviously at the moment just above flat but on the, the high of the day oil to, to wrap things up before having a quick look at uh, the overview of the, the markets at 58 I mean it's just been so important it really has not just from uh, last week again a couple of times but the 9th and uh, the end of November and of course the beginning of, of February last year massive massive level and and for now it's holding uh, on the multitude of tests one two three um, I think we could we could for sure still get another test of that uh, Trump's tweet last week doing little to sort of really consistently move the market lower I'd, I'd, I'd say as a, a sort of line in the sand 55 is obviously quite important uh, for this sort of mini range that we're still in. If that was to go, I don't see why the market can't move quite quickly uh, back down to uh, around 50, and let me just get the rectangle out, around this sort of area here. Again, similar to gold, where you've got quite a lot of people uh, that potentially are still trapped long or, or short, and there's a lot of liquidity around that area from those lows, and that's sort of looking 51s to $52. So 55 important for, to the upside. Um, and then uh, to the downside sort of holding that and then obviously 58 a key level to, to be aware of having a look at European markets that gap has, has been filled early morning uh, pivot holding quite well uh, and despite the sort of the, the strength of the euro dollar to the downside potentially that might be the reason we're just sort of finding a bit of support on that weaker euro for, for the DAX as well for US equities though I would be keeping an eye to see how that uh, low of the day Holds another test of that, a quick short down to the sort of high that we had on Friday is not a, a bad idea in, in, in my eyes. Uh, but for now, obviously, uh, I wouldn't be going chasing gold too much, keeping an eye on that, that trend line uh, and the pound, obviously, for now, relatively contained. Just to finish on the pound, um, that high that we had, obviously, it's got the pivots on here, but the high that we had from September last year. Uh, not a bad area people would have looked to have taken profit I think short term I'd, I'd still do favor the upside but it might be worth just waiting for a bit of a uh, bit more positive news as you also do have a potential bit of dollar strength coming back into the market um, hope you all have a, a good trading day ahead as Ant mentioned the, the report will be out uh, around midday so any questions before that please feel free or after the report comes out as well uh, but if I don't speak to you hope you have a good day and, and good luck for, for the rest of the week